Um, well, welcome everyone to the annual Step Centre lecture. My name is Ian Scoots. Um, I'm the director of the SRC Step Centre, uh, which has been running since uh, 2005, 2006. And we always have the Step Centre annual lecture on the first day of the Step Summer School, which is a fantastic annual event. Uh, which uh, this year we have 46 participants, I think, from 23 different countries uh, who are in the audience today. Uh, and this is a fantastic opportunity for them to <coughs> engage with a, a wider debate. Now, we're really, really delighted to have Achim Steiner here uh, to give the annual lecture this year. Um, Achim is the director of the Martin School at Oxford. Um, before that, as many of you know, he was Executive Director at UNEP and has very recently been appointed as the new Administrator for the UNDP, UN Development Programme. So this is really, we're very lucky to capture him before he heads to New York at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, but this is a really important moment, I think, uh, to have this discussion. Um, Achim has been a long-term friend of, of the Step Centre from the beginning, and indeed uh, I've known Achim for a scarily long time, um, which I won't reveal, uh, but we lived in a house in Oxford when we were undergraduates, where in, a, in a house where you had to uh, break the ice in the toilet in the morning. <laughs> the winter. So we've moved on from there. Achim has moved slightly to higher levels than me, but uh, there we are. <laughs> Um, but no, more seriously, this is a moment I think that we all agree is an absolutely essential one to have debates about sustainability and development. And Arkin is going to be talking about sustainable development and the green economy agenda and revisiting that, particularly in the light of questions around challenges to multilateralism, what the new world orders look like from the perspective of uh, international agreements around, for example, climate change or the SDGs, and where do we go from here? And I think this is a subject that's really important for us at the STEP Centre and all the participants in the summer school, um, but also more broadly. And, and welcome to everybody to this. I'm handing over to Akin for this talk. Thank you. Well, Ian, first of all, thank you for your kind words of introduction. We <coughs> lived in very challenging conditions, but uh, <laughs> aspire to once, one day overcome them. And uh, uh, having just walked through this extraordinary beautiful campus here, I have to say for all of you who have um, Sussex or IDS at your home, or those of you who are here for a couple of weeks, congratulations. What a gorgeous place to study in and, and, and live and, and operate. I'm also very grateful that um, I have a chance to test out some ideas with you today, because as Ian just said, I left the UN uh, just about a year ago, found myself in this extraordinarily interesting environment in a university such as Oxford, leading the Oxford Martin School, which is a school that was established by James Martin about 11 years ago, um, with a sense of disquiet and impatience about this being possibly the best or the worst century in human history that research, in the way that it was being conducted, was not living up to the challenge of actually providing solutions, partly because of the laws of gravity of academic success and uh, career making, which essentially forces you into silos, into publishing, into becoming ever more specialized about something specific, because that's the frontiers of academic research. And very often also not seeing that most challenges we face require the expertise of more than one discipline. Now, to those of you who sit here and to those who have you know, development as their field of practice or research, this is nothing new. And yet, if you look a little bit outwards to our peers, to our community, either in universities and in institutions, the harsh reality is we replicate these models. And I think I was just sitting at the tail end of, of the session there, and um, as you said, uh, Andy, Sometimes being an economist is already a normative horizon that has limitations, tunnel vision, and so is sociology and psychology and um, whatever else you may choose. So in having invited me to come here today, I want to share with you some of the 
journey that I have myself gone through in terms of observing, learning, appreciating, trying to understand how do you actually make a difference in what is first of all always not your reality but somebody else's reality if you work in development. That's a very important departure point. Secondly, that actions have consequences. And very often in the history of development, we postulated great paradigms and theories of change and so on, and screwed up a lot of people's lives in the process. And unfortunately, the price is rarely paid by those who produce the ideas or have the institutions that transport them, but usually by those in whose name that whole development paradigm was articulated in the first place. Now I know, and that's why I chose also a slightly cheeky end to my title, that Sussex has made it its specialization to challenge, but also to postulate, and then spending the next 10 years revisiting its own postulation. So <laughs> I, I join this tradition here today um, by saying, well, you know, sustainable development is not new. The green economy discourse that some of you may be familiar with is not new any longer either. The question is, is something that in its essence and its DNA carries much of what we think needs to happen and therefore is also rooted in a, let's say, appropriate analysis but has not necessarily succeeded in changing the world still remain relevant. Many of you who sit here will no doubt look at something like Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals as yet another product that emanates from endless process, large conference rooms, government-led, state-led processes, how relevant is it to those who are on the streets right now who are facing drought, uh, water scarcity, no access to land, no health care? I want to persuade you this afternoon that it is worth sometimes taking a step back. Because if you really want to think in systems, and if you really want to change systems, then it is vitally important to sometimes step one or two or three stages up in order to begin to look at systems within systems and begin to also articulate theories of change or strategies that may not be optimal or precise or accurate in terms of an analytical framework, but that are real in terms of where people are or where they find themselves constrained or empowered to act. So if you take the global intrade that we face right now, the development profession, first of all, should get some therapy because <laughs> a lot of this stuff has been in Sussex, in the World Bank, in the United Nations, in DFID, or whatever it was called before, on the agenda for years. So these problems are not made by others, but they are created out of the circumstances, the realities, the institutions <coughs> that in one way or another many of us have been part of for a long time, or perhaps are about to become part of. I won't go into the details, but just the spectrum from the climate change end to the financial stability, to cyber security, how appropriate after the last weekend. Emerging viruses, migrant crisis, terrorism, the nature of conflict in the year 2017 is not comparable to the nature of conflict in, let's say, 1957 or 1977. Terrorism has changed also the capacity in terms of intervention, its driving forces. So the global intrade is the first thing that should make us pause for a moment and ask ourselves what is it actually we mean by development when we are trying to help a world with all of this on its <coughs> intrade? <coughs> After that, the shocks, which are often um, amplifications of existing realities. And take the financial crisis of 2008 and reflect for a moment what a terrible price it imposed on many people across the world but not the Dow Jones Index, oddly enough. You know the Dow Jones Index have recovered to its financial crisis levels almost 24 months after the financial crisis had its peak. It also coincided with a moment where over $3,000 billion equivalent had been borrowed by societies. Our grandchildren had been essentially asked to underwrite a screw-up in our financial system in 2008. So the disconnect between financial markets and where societies and our economies, and now you can use different terminologies, the real economy, the people's economy, the poor people's economy, many narratives can fit into that, but what it also produces is not without precedent, is part of what we are now 
watching and witnessing unfold before our very own eyes. The reaction of a society with time lag to the kind of perversion, if you want, of the promise that was made when we all rode on that train of, um, let's say, the Anglo-American transatlantic consensus of how financial markets should enable us to drive development. So here we find ourselves with globalization having been a dominant paradigm, largely reduced an economic dimension and the notion of liberalization and trade for the better part of 30 years. Indeed, giving rise to many things that it alluded to, <clears throat> such as people and labor becoming a global resource, um, to capital moving, but also what we have witnessed is not only the magnitude and scaling up of those phenomena, but also the increasing realization that for some, this would work very well. But for an increasing and growing number of people, it actually wasn't working. So the financial crisis is not something we should view in isolation. We need to also look at what essentially has, in one way or another, shaped the development discourse for the better part of three decades. Whether you call it the Washington Consensus, whether you call it structural adjustment, I see Richard somewhere, I, I'm sitting up there, I had the great privilege with Liz yesterday to sit with Richard, and as you pointed out, Richard, if you look at the cost of structural adjustment in terms of the opportunity cost imposed on countries of lost growth over decades, it runs into trillions. Now, that's the price we're in part paying for that, I would say, better part of two decades of trying to interpret a shortcut to progress and development. But here is another phenomenon that is part of global interest right now. So in a world of extraordinary opportunity, we suddenly find ourselves unable to cope with 60 million people fleeing the place that they call home. That is the number, roughly, that is currently displaced annually from places that they had no intention of leaving, but find themselves on the move, whether inside a country or beyond national borders. And many of you are familiar with how much of a struggle it has proven, even in a wealthy region like Europe, <coughs> to deal with this kind of shock. So another way of looking at the complexity of our time is this notion of living in the age of the Anthropocene. Never in human history, and I say human history, has this planet had to deal with these kinds of curves of growth, whether in just volume of services utilized, transportation, the growth in number of people, and all of you will be familiar with it, emissions of carbon dioxide, forest loss, <coughs> ecological infrastructure, fertilizer consumption, fresh water use. So we also have to recognize that not only are we trying to deal with the challenges of a global economic system in which there are many more people consuming many more things, depleting many more resources, you're also trying to manage a financial and economic paradigm against the backdrop of fundamentally changing conditions. So along comes another one, climate change. Actually, uh, Liz, who studied here a few years ago, well actually I need to say that somewhere in the 1980s, mentioned that it was in Sussex that climate change and development was one of the first places where it was being linked at the time. You know, when you were a graduate in 1983, you didn't hear a lot about climate change. And yet, here we are in a world where the challenge of dealing with something that 30 years ago maybe was taught in the physics or an atmospheric um, scientific study course is now part of our reality and driving a agenda of change like no other single threat to the future of this planet. Again, you will see me, I brought quite a few slides and I will make them available to you to look at later, so some of them I simply use as a backdrop. Now, I'm sure in Sussex there will be some who are also studying the linkage between climate change, changing weather conditions, extreme weather events, and conflict. I just put this one up because there are some who argue that it is quite clearly already observable that conflict and changes in weather conditions, climate change, will actually act as an amplifier for existing tensions, inequalities, whether on land, on water, or otherwise. And therefore, 
it is not just a natural phenomenon we're trying to deal with. <coughs> it links to the social, it links to the economic, without even taking a breath between any of these. Another part that makes thinking about development in the year 2017 so difficult to capture is that we're living through yet another age of extraordinary technological change. I don't know how many of you have spent time, and I've had the privilege over the last um, year in Oxford to meet many of those who are working on the frontier of the digital economy, of artificial intelligence, of big machine learning. And I have to say, I had no idea until I got there of the dimensions of change that this will imply, not just in terms of our apps or in terms of what Uber can do or what Amazon can do when it studies us or what happens to you when you're in London Heathrow Airport and you click into a free Wi-Fi service, what you don't realize is when you accept the terms and conditions in London Heathrow for using the free Wi-Fi, you also agree for all your photographs on your phone to be scanned, not in terms of the imagery itself but what's on it. So if it is a toilet sink, or a wash basin or a fridge in it, these data are then compiled in order to reinsert into your life advertisements. Have you had any idea that this is the contract you just signed for free Wi-Fi? Now, go one step further. Minibots, video analytics, biometrics, facial recognition, gesture recognition, computer vision, machine learning, interface engines. Not only is there an extraordinary opportunity emerging in terms of mobility, for instance, one um, pilot study that looked at mobility and examined how many vehicles would you need if you use public transport in an internodal sense of taxis, buses, railways, trams in a city such as Lisbon to provide the same amount of transport service <coughs> equivalent to what is being provided today. And the extraordinary answer was both. Well, if you had shared taxis and um, bus services and all of them internodally connected, you would only need 20% of the vehicles. So autonomous driving vehicles that can just zoom around town, stop wherever you are with your app, pick you up and drop you somewhere else, would free our cities of the madness of traffic congestion, pollution, and everything else we have. In Europe, most vehicles, actually on average, vehicles are only moving 3% of the time across an annual cycle. They're parked 97% of the time. That's the reality. And yet we invest often three, four, five, or six, seven salaries to buy an object with which to move in traffic jams from A to B because we are not providing mobility services in the 21st century. And this technology universe creates extraordinary opportunities, including in manufacturing. In Oxford is the mini factory that produces a thousand minis a day. I visited that factory in December. It's a factory with a kind of technology automation roughly 20 years, 15 to 20 years old in terms of the frontiers. The entire factory is essentially one of robots building these cars and the people you see, at least in the first half to the three quarters of the production line, are people who are maintaining the robots. Now imagine for a moment the kind of automation we are speaking about now, and at the Oxford Martin School we have a project on automation and technology and employment. And um, with Carl Fry there have been a number of publications now that say, look, if you take the US today, you can assume that roughly 47% of all jobs in the United States are subject to some kind of potential impact to automation. Now, if you're interested in development, think for a moment outside the United States and project this onto a continent such as Africa. One billion people today, two billion people by the 19, uh, 2050s, possibly, no, sorry, um, one billion today, we are talking about a doubling of the population somewhere in the next 20 to 30 years. Mid-century could go up to four billion. Certainly in the context of thinking about development, jobs, livelihoods, and employment, has Africa still the opportunity to move through the kind of industrialization, relocation of production onto the continent? Or will the AI, digital economy of manufacturing, find its way to Africa? Absolutely. But who will it employ? Or how many people will it employ? It's not the story of the 1950s where essentially, you know, through garment factories moving and then, you know, the low-end technology sector assembly lines moving employment from India to Bangladesh to China to Taiwan, Korea, essentially provided the chronology of, of upgrading a domestic 
economy. So we may have 2 billion people, the largest number of young people entering the labor market in Africa, suddenly being confronted with a global marketplace that, yes, Africa will be able to access in terms of technology. But where will people find jobs and livelihoods? So technology is as dramatic a development factor, not in the enabling sense, but increasingly also in the disabling, or at least in the risk management sense. So all of this as a backdrop to what I wanted to present to you as the setting in which we have to think about development in the year 2017. It's a lot more difficult to come up with simple answers. It's a lot more difficult to just revisit a paradigm, add some lessons learned, and in a sense say, look, we know what needs doing. This is the direction in which we move. In fact, the development community finds itself at a very confused, and I would say, also uncertain moment in, in, in the way that it thinks about what happens next. In the broader context, deepening political segmentation and polarization are now part of our everyday discourse. Who would have thought that we would describe a world in Europe or the United States or Brazil in the way that we have to do it now? Who would have thought 20 years ago that we would describe China and its increasing global role in the way that we do now. But particularly the financial crisis, I want to go back to that, lives on. It is haunting us in ways that we need to better understand because it in part allows us also to focus on some of the things that need to change. Financial crises are policy failures and repeated policy failures devalue traditional sources of authority. 2008 was just another unfortunately very expensive moment in which our financial system, first of all, committed a grave error, but also revealed itself as not delivering on that great <coughs> promise it was trading on. Paradigm shifts that often come out of these crises you know, bring complexity. They <coughs> blur things, and they also introduce unpredictability. Reactionary political movements arising globally are born of a desire for control, simplicity, safety, and order. Sounds familiar, doesn't it, if you project that onto the narratives that are unfolding around us. And Marlene Albright had a wonderful way of, in her you know, unique um, sense of humor, but also incisive way, to describe this phenomenon of people are talking to their governments using 21st century technology, either apps, the internet, etc. Governments listen on 20th century technology and respond with 19th century policies. <coughs> so here we are the cast of development professionals, researchers, and analysts, are we, in a sense, part of this reality, or do we stand outside it? I don't want to dwell on an introspection, but what I'm trying to say is that the challenge for us right now is perhaps unprecedented in complexity and also in the challenge of managing transitions that are, in some ways, without precedent. Why do I say that? Well. The prolonged fiscal aftershocks that we are living through right now are manifesting themselves in a level of extreme poverty or alienation that now touches the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Not a few local communities, not a few thousand, not in isolated places, but there are whole areas across the global financial economy and across territories where people essentially are poorer, worse off, and feel hard done by. We're also facing a phenomenon of mass movements where the foundations of the right to protection are being questioned. Foundations that have been part of our international principle of solidarity, but also of a rights-based approach to assisting people who have to flee their country, are being questioned. Where we are so scared to even evolve these instruments because we actually believe, very often in international negotiations, that we may end up with something worse than we had up to now. Dramatic technological change and all these phenomena resulting in a transition that in one respect is without precedent. Never before in the history of, let's say, modern social and economic management 
did we have to transform virtually our entire economy because of a factor such as carbon dioxide emissions? Yet what climate change and what the Paris Agreement and what science and what increasingly also economics tells us is that that is precisely what we have to do. We have to decarbonize our economy in a global setting, literally within 40 years. Otherwise, there is no guarantee of this two-degree pathway. Now, when you say that, in an age where fossil fuels have been the blood and the veins of our countries, of progress, of development, of um, technology deployment, you are deeply disturbing the entire system. But it's not only climate change that is imposing this extraordinary phenomenon. I actually sometimes worry more about the lack of appreciation of how close we are coming to a point where we actually cannot explain how on earth we will feed 10 million people without depleting the ecological infrastructure of this planet at the rate we do already now. As many of you are aware, we are already going through an age in which we have a net loss of arable land annually occurring across the planet. So at a time when FAO and others project an increase in the food production of up to 70% over the next decades, we are actually depleting the very capital on which we depend for growing food. 70% of the world's fresh water resources are, well, I will not go into the details, but this is just another way of looking at land use and the competition for land and the competition between people, uh, nature, sometimes around issues such as grazing or water or simply ownership. But if you then take something like food and relate it also to the current reality of world water requirements, and you ask yourself, so if intensification of agriculture were to work in the model of the last 150 years, clearly it would imply, in many cases, irrigation. Now, if 70% of the world's water use is already agriculture, how on earth are we in a world of 3 billion more people in the next 40 years, intensify agriculture, and use more water for producing food, when we can't even provide enough water anymore to people? The projections right now are that somewhere around 2020, 2025, i.e. less than 10 years away, a third of humanity will live in water-constrained conditions. Water uncertainty basically means you are not able to guarantee a person access to sufficient water over a year in a calendar sense. So these are boundaries that we are hitting and, and crossing right now that require the kind of transformation that is both ambitious and of a scale and systemic that I would argue we have not had to face before. Energy is simply another illustration, although here, in some ways, the story is also one of beginning to show us how we can reinvent a pathway that 20 years ago was described by those who ran the world's energy markets and systems and technology providers as, forget about renewables, can't use them, too expensive, wouldn't be relevant, and in any case, we can provide enough energy for the world. Well, with all the climate change reality that has hit us now, and despite having a vision of carbon capture technology being able to miraculously extract carbon dioxide and bury it in the ground, we are actually in the midst of an energy revolution already. And it's a remarkable one. Remarkable both in terms of the speed with which it is spreading, not only in number terms, but also geographical. Because remember, in this very hall here, I wouldn't be surprised if five or ten years ago, there would have been quite a few lectures saying, well, all this renewable stuff is very well, but it's for the rich. It's a luxury for the OECD economies. It's not relevant to people who can hardly find enough wood to cook their food in the evening. Well, some of those lectures would have to be rewritten today, because in the context of a continent such as Africa, where 65 to 70 percent of its people today have no access to electricity, the extraordinary failure of 70 years of the simplest of technology connect to people, give them access to power and develop a more <coughs> narrative, I have to explain how it is possible that close to three quarters of African citizens today are not connected to a modern electricity source. Along comes this technology called renewables that, you know, even in the development, uh, development 
narrative a few years ago was viewed as peripheral to this challenge, and it actually becomes the shortcut for access to energy in Africa. In just the last four to five years, from Morocco through to Ethiopia, Kenya as one of the pioneers, but also Ghana, Mozambique, South Africa, and, and the names of countries in terms of a list grows longer almost by the week. Africa is now discovering that actually renewable energy is not only technologically relevant, economically viable, but it actually speaks to the reality of how to connect hundreds of millions of people who do not yet live in cities, and therefore off-grid systems become a stepping stone to building a national grid from the ground up, rather than the notion that only centralized, heavy infrastructure, heavy capital-dependent electricity-generating technology is the shortcut to access to energy. So it is in this example that, in part, I want to begin to touch on one theme of my lecture today, which is we need to challenge these assumptions that are often made by people who have spent their lives from the day they were trained to the day that they were let loose on the world, as we all are when we leave university, and have had the privilege to feel that we now know which direction we need to go. We enter institutions that have operated with the same paradigm for years, and before we know it, we become part of a group of people who rationalize the status quo rather than actually advocating a fundamental rethink. Now, universities, to some extent, are an antidote to that. And that is why I think also the work of you know, Sussex, the Institute of Development Studies, and many similar institutions across the world are so vital to this discourse because the tendency of people as individuals in institutions to simply continue to trade on established wisdom is extraordinarily tempting. And here we are, climate change that until a few years ago, by most developing country development economists and thinkers, was first of all viewed as the responsibility of the North and therefore their problem. Secondly, as a distraction from the fundamental development needs of a pathway towards industrialization, poverty reduction, better health care infrastructure, and therefore not seen as central to the development planning process of a country, is today in a completely different place. The Paris Agreement was no accident, ladies and gentlemen. It was an extraordinarily wise decision by many people to say, here is an issue that we can no longer trade in that narrative of North and South responsibility legacy. We actually have to achieve a breakthrough. Now, you may think a lot of things about the Paris Agreement, but let me assure you, in history, it is with the exception of the Montreal Protocol about you know, dealing with the hole in the ozone layer without precedent. We now have virtually every country in the world having embraced a strategy for dealing with climate change. And yes, you might sit in this room and say, oh, what about a certain country across the Atlantic? <laughs> well, again, step back for a moment. Governments come, governments go. Certain countries go through a particular phase of questioning. I would say to you, just watch the Paris Agreement and watch how one or two countries will find themselves very much out on the limb, on their own. Ten years ago, one country or two could indeed really affect this global process. My assumption is not this time around. And the country that will pay the highest price over time will actually be the country that steps outside of this consensus. But that is for the future to tell. What I put up here is simply the connection suddenly of linking development to acting on climate change. At its simplest, phasing out fossil fuels helps us to reduce <coughs> carbon dioxide emissions, but it also deals with pollution, killing over 7 million people a year prematurely. It actually helps us to address mobility. It helps us to address also the future of agriculture, to reinsert an appreciation that forests are not only measured in value by the timber that they produce, or a little bit of um, contingent evaluation in terms of leisure value to urban residents. Forests are part of the ecological foundation that allows us to think about development in the 21st century. And sometimes it's not the forest that is next to you. It may be the forest that is in the Amazon, it may be the boreal forest, it is not the resource that is just next to you, 
it is actually a signal and a symbol of a planetary reality that actions in one part of the world will fundamentally affect my life and the quality of life and the choices of the next generation. Similarly, along the path of industrialization, cars that a few years ago were viewed as a distraction against the privilege of the rich, e-mobility, what a waste of time when your interest about poverty and so on. Well, India has just set itself a target that by 2030, only e-vehicles will be sold in India. And electric mobility is suddenly going through the same vertical curve as did cell phone technology and all that came with it when smartphones emerged and the interface of apps made it almost impossible not to own one. So into this world comes something called Agenda 2030 in the SDGs. And as I said at the beginning of my lecture, you may be tempted to say, well, is this really going to do anything? Now, I don't want to you know, be a missionary for the SDGs here today, but I would like to say two things to you that I think are important to think about. Again, zoom out for a moment. Don't look at the boxes in themselves, but look at something quite extraordinary. So at a time when the traditional agenda setting and narrative defining institutions, named the Bretton Woods institutions, were on the retreat and on the defensive. Namely, structure adjustment was no longer setting the agenda, and the World Bank was no longer simply issuing its gray covers and white cover reports in order to say, well, this is what we now think will happen next. There was the year 2015, where in this whole disarray, suddenly the United Nations became the place where the world actually tried to find common ground. It's a very bizarre, counterintuitive, and certainly not predictive phenomenon. I don't have an answer exactly of why this happened, but not only did it organize four major events during that year, which agreed on the disaster risk reduction framework in Sendai, a admittedly somewhat limping financing for development, finance for development summit in Addis, but then came this extraordinary moment where the entire General Assembly adopted, for the first time in 70 years, a development agenda that not only overcame this notion that development is something to do with poor countries and the rich are in another universe, no, it's universal. For the first time in post-war history do we have a development agenda that is holding every country to account. Extraordinary political generosity by the G77 to say, okay, we are going to essentially accept that we are in one development discourse. And also remarkable that the North, the so-called North, <coughs> accepted that it does not stand outside this sustainable development narrative as an observer, but as an actor that is equally accountable. Secondly, integration. We, and in Sussex, and in summits, and everywhere around the world, have been talking about sustainable development since the better part of the late 80s and 90s. 92, Rio Earth Summit, the three pillars, we spent roughly another 20 years trying to figure out how do you then connect the narrative across the three pillars, overcome this notion of a chronology of development where economics creates the opportunities, then we deal with social inequality as a problem, and finally we get around to sorting out the environment, which is really the luxury of those who've made it. This is a fundamental affirmation of a fundamental challenge to this development discourse, because here every goal carries within it a different notion, the triple helix of development, the notion that you cannot continue in the 21st century in a world of 7, 8 billion people with the kind of consumption and pollution footprint we have mm -hmm. and the inequality, Gini coefficient reality we face, argue that that chronology is the way forward. That is why I look to Agenda 2030 in a very different way than someone said, ah, oh, 17 goals, how can people remember those? And then targets and indicators. Mm -hmm. I look at it and say, this is an extraordinary miracle in the middle of a re-emerging polarity in geopolitics. In the wake of a major financial and economic crisis and a lack of leadership uh, from state-led actors, the United Nations General Assembly adopts this agenda and gives us a way of looking at development that if we use it, and that is my point, this is not the Ten Commandments to which you bow and pray. This is the foundation. These are the tentative stepping stones on which we walk as we try to create concepts for now implementing 
this understanding of development. That, in essence, is what I've just spoken about. So, let me just for a moment link this also to the second discourse, namely the green economy. For those who may be familiar with it, it was during my time at ULIP my deep conviction that the, in a sense, antipolar relationship between economists and environmentalists had become a real liability to the development discourse. And therefore, I spent quite a bit of energy and time with many around the world who saw the same challenge of trying to overcome these narratives that, you know, at its simplest, in a TV talk show or with a ministerial speech, would say anything you do for the environment comes at the detriment of economic progress, and anything to do with the economy must, by definition, harm the environment. You all sit here as wise people and would probably agree with that, understanding that this doesn't either reflect reality nor does it help us. But how to bring people together who think and study the environment in natural science terms, in ecological and ecosystem terms, understand the web of life, with those who are, in a sense, with rational expectation schools and economic modeling, interpreting the human psychology of how you react to a cheaper fridge that is offered to you as opposed to a more environmentally relevant fridge. The reality all of you face every day as you go and shop. Well, the green economy became, if you want, a journey in studying what were countries and people actually doing across the world. Not to come up with a theory or a new ecological economics school, no. To just study what people were doing. And we found an extraordinary global think tank factory of innovation in every country. And lo and behold, actually more so in developing countries and emerging economies than in the traditional OECD countries. And that was, to me, a major surprise. Many people have spent and want to continue to spend enormous amounts of time in definitions. And Andy, again, you said in the steps section just now, terminology and terms carry with them a great deal of meaning and power definition. But there is a balance between wanting to define something that you're actually not able to define to the nth degree, or creating, if you want, a framework within which to study what is unfolding before you, because you cannot actually fully understand it. It is in that spirit that we then chose the notion of a green economy is one that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcity. That was enough for us to go out and study innovation, and innovation we found. The only thing I want to say is there are many schools and you know, shades of green. Economy, green growth, uh, etc. Circular economy. The point being there is a deliberate difference between talking about a green economy and green growth. One implies greening growth, and therefore maintains the notion that growth is the defining indicator for progress. The green economy talks about transition and transformation in the sense of understanding that economic success in the future is not defined by a simplistic notion of growth. But along the way, many of the actions that one would take, at least in the initial part of the pathway, actually very similar was our <coughs> discovery. I won't spend much time in here. This is just to give you a greater sense of the numbers that underpin and also drive some of these green economy innovations. Where I want to get to is that rethinking and reinventing our economy is now the challenge for development. If you want to address either the notion of you know, <coughs> economic, social, and environmental um, development, if you want to address Agenda 2030, if you want to address climate change, if you want to address inequality, jobs, the relation between automation and future employment markets, you have to fundamentally rethink how we will run our economy. But it is an economy that is not defined by either GDP growth alone or the kind of economic paradigm that created the notion that trade-offs are actually the currency we trade in over time in development. So let me just leave that thought with you. I'm a great opponent of using the concept of trade-offs, not because it's not useful and practical, but the way we have used trade-offs in development is often quite perverse. Because those who decide what is worth trading off are usually people who are not those who pay the price. Mm -hmm. It is something I learned when I was Secretary General of the World Commission on Dams, and we went out and studied dam construction in the 20th century. 
where in the name of development, of providing power to the city, and so on, water for irrigation and food security, trade-offs were justified to the extent that tens of millions of people were forcibly resettled, worse off than before, not even having access to electricity, also ruining, if you want, riparian agricultural systems that have been there for hundreds of years for tens of thousands of people in the name of progress to provide power to the city. That is the currency which we also have to be extremely cautious. Trade-offs have been a very dangerous way of rationalizing development decisions. I'm not saying that we have to make choices, but we, and that was the decision of the commissioners at the time, the World Commission on Lands, decided to ban the term trade-offs in the report and use the term choices, because what choices imply <laughs> is that people actually make a deliberate decision to go this way or that way. And the second part of making that decision-making process work is to make sure that all of them are at the table when the choice is made. And it is a fundamental challenge to traditional development thinking and planning. So at the heart of the green economy are two relatively simple, powerful, but um, essentially very challenging concepts. Decoupling in terms of resource consumption and economic progress and development, and decoupling of impact in terms of pollution, resource degradation, etc. We have struggled in particular to deal with this notion that the green economy is socially blind. And there is some truth to it because the origins of that discourse were very much economics in a progress narrative and environment in terms of a pollution and loss of natural resources and habitat narrative. I think our great challenge as the first part linking the Agenda 2030 is showed, if we cannot address the issue of inequality and employment and livelihoods and different kinds of economies in the future that don't simply assume that people move to the city in order to escape the entrapment of poverty, but will have to create new economies in the rural um, geography of a significant number of nations <coughs> and therefore find a way to find <coughs> economic progress and opportunity and the connection to global marketplaces emerge at their place of living and working and surviving today is critical to being able to move forward. Public policy, I think, will in the coming years become much more important again. And this is not to go back to you know, this period where we thought that the state is the solution to all problems, speak 60s, 70s, into the 80s, and then almost the other end of the extreme, the Chicago boys and the school of you know, just get the state out of the economy and let you know, the market forces determine what happens next. We wasted the better part of, I would say, three decades in this pendulum from one extreme to the other. Public policy is as much about an expression of social choice and political preference as it is also the enabling of markets to function and to work. And my argument has often been that markets are not analogous to the physical laws of science where supply and demand function almost as an equivalent to the laws of gravity. No, they are a human construct. They have been for centuries. And in those human constructs, we insert priorities, ethics, rights, opportunities, the license to operate. And public policy is the way in which we do this, particularly in our era today. And one area is this question of job creation. Governments lose elections when unemployment rates reach a certain point. When governments, public policy cannot create the kind of economic conditions in which the vast majority of people have the choice to work. So what happens next on the job front is absolutely central. And I often wonder why it is that in our analysis of public policy options and opportunities, in an age where employment is such a challenge in many countries, and pollution has become such a challenge to many societies, economies, and people, why is a concept such as an ecological tax reform not actually breaking into the center stage of political discourse? Because if you could, just imagine for a moment, Reduce the cost of a unit of labor in our economy by de-taxing the fact of labor. Because, again, strange thing. In a time where unemployment is a challenge, youth unemployment is a crisis in many countries, the thing that is taxed most in our societies is actually people working. Income tax and all the other taxes that come with it. So why not try 
and take an approach where we don't just have the Green Party arguing for a tax on petrol, but we have a national development ministry and a treasury in a country such as the UK saying, how do we actually reduce the cost of labor, make people more attractive and not so replaceable with automation, and tax the balance in our society, shift the burden of taxation, rethink fiscal policy with a green economy, but also an inclusive and livelihood paradigm driving it. Or, and you may agree or disagree with this, as Bill Gates put forward a notion a few weeks ago, robots, automation. Why should a robot actually not be taxed like a human being doing the same amount of work? I think it's a very interesting idea because it creates an equivalence, because we have this strange view that a human being who works and earns money is a perfectly legitimate target for the collective to tax. But a company that deploys technology and puts thousands of robots in his or her place somehow is allowed to produce and then argue, well, you know, technology and automation and robots are just so much cheaper. What stops us as a society and as development thinkers from saying, well, these are choices that we can make. And it's not being a Luddite, it's just correcting for things that are essentially becoming market failures, not just in an economic and profit loss making sense, but market failures in a social and developmental sense. So, time is running out for me. I want to just point you to a couple of other areas that I think are critical to take seriously. The private sector. Who is the private sector? Development economists and development practitioners have a somewhat disturbed relationship with the private sector, either in public institutions because they're so scared that somebody will say, oh, you did something because you thereby favored a company. There are those who look at multinationals as often having usurped national legislation, taking advantage of tax loopholes, moving capital freely. And indeed, one of the questions is, why should the private sector get away with billions of dollars of revenue and yet hardly paying any taxes because they just have better tax consultants. But that's not really a crime of companies. It's the failure of public policy. And it took the OECD until about two or three years ago and the G7 and then the G20 to say, we are being stupid here. It's we who create these tax loopholes. And therefore, it is perhaps now up to us to also do something about it. The private sector, at the end of the day, I believe, has to be a central actor in development. And don't always think of Amazon.com or GM or you know, uh, Tesla, for that matter, as the private sector. The private sector starts with the farmer who produces a kilo of tomatoes and tries to sell them at the market once a week. It is the person who is able to open a corner shop or run a cell phone system or an Mpesa system in Kenya and earns just enough to get to the next level. In fact, the private sector is 70% to 80% of our economy, virtually everywhere. Public finance, public budgets that governments run usually account for less than 20% of GDP. So if you want to have development take a different trajectory, respond to the intrade that we have here, and want to define that with the private sector being somehow a consequential actor in this, I think we are making a great mistake. How to do it? Well, here is just um, a couple of examples from a, a recent commission valuing the SDG prize, which is pointing to the trillions of dollars of economic activity that are associated with a SDG compatible interpretation of the markets and sectors where the private sector could lead in food and agriculture, in cities, and also in energy and materials. I end by just offering you a sense of why these times in which we are currently trying to revisit, rethink, and also articulate a vision of development are so profoundly different and dynamic. In Davos this January, President Xi Jinping, literally within hours of President Trump, declaring a kind of departure of the US from its established role in globalization, trade, etc., and President Xi Jinping took the center stage and essentially announced for the first time in, let's say, the post-war global economic miracle period of China, that actually China is engaging globally now. And just this week, with the Belt and Road Summit, you can see that this is not narrative. China has, in the last three or four years, decided that 
the era in which it was inwardly focused and argued that everything happening outside was not its preoccupation, but it was focused on its own development, has ended. China is stepping onto the global stage. And therefore, it will be extremely interesting to see what happens next, because in sheer scale terms, <coughs> this is now the country that is at the forefront of addressing SDGs, poverty reduction, transition to cleaner energy, rethinking agriculture, food, water, land use. I won't go into the data, but just think for a moment what this means. And remarkably enough, in the current five-year plan, introduces a narrative that, if sustained and taken seriously in terms of its own development thinking, is profoundly transformative. The notion of ecological civilization. In much of you know, Western uh, development and media commentary on this, there's an element of cynicism, skepticism that accompanies this discussion. Because clearly, China's ecological and environmental track record over the last 30 years is disastrous in many ways, as it was for many other countries who went through the stages of development. It's just that in China, it has become profoundly social, political, economic, and ecological. And I would venture to say that in looking at the, let's say, innovation curve in rethinking development, we would all be well advised to study carefully how China is now trying to tackle this challenge of development in the framework of an Agenda 2030 or a green economy or an ecological civilization setting. Because not only by speed and by scale, but also by willing to try out different approaches, will we see a great deal of at least different things happening in the development discourse, but in a very real setting of over a billion people trying to rethink their development. So I end by saying, you know, when you take the in-tray, you can step back and say, it's a bad time to be a 25-year-old or a 30-year-old. And certainly, for somebody who is born today, what kind of outlook is this that we are presenting to them? I continue to believe, as I said at the beginning when I mentioned Jim Martin, who created within the University of Oxford this Oxford Martin School, that this could be truly the worst century in human history in terms of destruction, self-destruction, whether physical, ecological, economic, or it could still be the best century. Because against all of what I've described, which are now risk factors, there are extraordinary opportunities for more people than ever before at higher levels of knowledge, science, technology, education, and health than ever before. And therefore, trying to sort of imagine a world in 2030 where we have ex reduced extreme poverty across much of Asia, where global maternal mortality is down to 150 deaths per 100,000, where there is a halt to declining forest cover, where more than 1.7 people, 1.7 billion people have been connected to electricity grids, is not unimaginable. It's actually perfectly doable. Where we find ourselves, however, right now is at a kind of psychological bottom end of the curve, which is the narrative where I began. The challenges, the financial crisis, the loss of faith and confidence in leadership in our societies, the number of people who feel that they have been left behind. That is where we now find ourselves. So from a phase where we began to perceive current business realities in a wider system context, consider how public and citizen sectors can best contribute. I, this is looking a little bit from somebody who sits in a corporate strategic planning department. We are now at the point where we have to embrace uncomfortable transition spaces from old to new. We have to stand back and scan emerging realities and also rethink how we look at models. We have to let go of what doesn't work, and here I mean less the academic research inquiry methodological focus, but rather how those who now have to go out there and mediate, facilitate, catalyze, and lead development decision making. And hopefully embrace uncertainty and the possibility that the future could be dramatically better. Because very often in development, we're not very good at describing <coughs> that part of the vision. That we seek out exponential innovations and opportunities, whether in technology or otherwise, that we implement business models in the sense of P 
people transacting with each other in not just a local but a global economic setting that are social, that are lean, integrated, and circular. It's one way of describing it. My main point is, if you think about development and what happens next, as a community of professionals, practitioners, and thinkers, we are at a fairly low end of the curve in terms of cyclical ups and downs. There is a vacuum there. We need leadership, we need innovation, but we also need a willingness to conceive of things to happen that by traditional, extrapolative, or otherwise modeling would simply be declared impossible. And that is, I hope, the vision with which we can give hope to people who at the end of the day will continue to be at the receiving end of the kind of thinking that we associate with development planning, development research, and development policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you.